Hello and welcome to the Interference Technology Webinar, PCB Suppression of ICs with BGA or Multiple Power Rails. My name is Belinda Stasiukevich and I'm the editor of Interference Technology. Established in 1970, Interference Technology helps EMI and EMC engineers find solutions to their various testing, design, application, and regulatory issues by publishing articles, news, and other practical content. This webinar is presented by Keith Armstrong. Keith graduated from Imperial College London in 1972 with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, specializing in analog circuit design and electromagnetic field theory. He formed Cherry Club Consultants Limited in 1990, which provides design services to help achieve compliance with EMC. They have currently nearly 800 satisfied customers in almost all areas where electronics are used. This webinar is one of many that Keith has done for Interference Technology. To view his other webinars, visit our website, www.interferencetechnology.com. This webinar today will be interactive. You'll be able to ask questions and answer polls, and we encourage you to participate. Take a look at your GoToWebinar navigation pane, the box on the right-hand corner of your screen. If at any time you have a question, we ask you to fill out the type box and hit Send. To make the screen minimize and maximize, click the arrow button. To raise your hand to ask a question or to report an issue, click the hand icon. We'll present the topic for 45 minutes, followed by a 15-minute question and answer session. Now Keith will begin the presentation. Thanks, Belinda. What she didn't say is that this is the, the item webinar series. It's better than Breaking Bad and the Game of Thrones combined. And um, uh, it's not, I don't mean just my webinars. All, all of them is, uh, are available on the on the item website. So let's get on with this anyway. <clears throat> uh, ICs with BGA packages and multiple DC rails. There we go. Or anything with multiple DC rails. So there's lots of types of uh, BGAs. It's a very common package these days. Here's an i5, uh, i5 core from Intel, sort of thing you might find in your cell phone or your laptop. Here's a powerful um, FPGA, it's a Vertex 7 from Xilinx, we'll, and we'll see that later on. Look at all those balls in an, an array there. And here's a, an ASIC process from uh, on the semiconductor, based on a 1.2 volt 110 nanometer process, and again, in a BGA package. So, the, the thing in general for cost-effective signal integrity and power integrity and EMC is that it's very important to have a solid PCB plane and especially a ground or zero volt plane. Now, during this webinar, I sometimes say zero volts and sometimes I say ground and they mean the same thing as far as I'm concerned in the PCB. So it's usually a solid zero volts or ground plane all over the board. And especially, most especially, underneath the ICs. Trouble is, when using through-hole plate uh, THP board manufacturing technology, you end up with an array of through-hole wires right through the board, on one on every pin underneath all the BGAs. This dramatically perforates the planes, and if you're not careful, you can end up with big gaps. I've seen. I've seen holes in the planes the size of the IC and significantly reduces their effectiveness for EMC. Now, when I'm talking about EMC here, in fact, these techniques, or this technique, is equally important for signal integrity and power integrity. There are two solutions, in fact. One is to use high-density interconnect, or microwire board technology, and the other one is to use fine-line through-hole plate techniques to at least get a proper mesh. You should remember, let's just go back a bit, the most cost-effective place to deal with SI, PI, or EMC is in the integrated circuits themselves. If you aren't actually designing your own one, and most of us aren't, the next most cost-effective place is in the PCB. So, um, the, the manager who thinks that the most cost-effective product is made from the cheapest parts, the lowest-cost bomb, is going to ruin 
the financial uh, viability of the company. Okay, um, you have to. It's worth spending, not worth. You have to spend money on the PCB in order to save more money elsewhere. Okay, it's got that out of the way. So. HDI technology is also called microwire, or it uses microwires. Sometimes it's called sequential build-up technology, or simply build-up, because what happens is that the various layers of the board are drilled, well, not drilled, but their holes are made in them and plated before the board, before the laminations are stacked together. Hence, it's build-up. The microwires are 0.15 millimeters or 6 tau in diameter or less. Now I'm going to say thou. Thou means thousandths of an inch. Um, it's very common in the US to call them mil, which is a bit silly um, because mil means millions and they're thousands. And the trouble with mil is it's easy to confuse it with millimeters. So even though we're not building any Mars landers at the moment, we don't want to get our units confused. So I'm going to use thou uh, and not mil. But for those of you who are used to mil, it's thou. The thing with microvires is they're only as long as it's necessary. So if you need a microvire to go between layers one and two, or two and three, that's how long they are. And they don't steal solder during reflow. So with a bit of care, you can use via in pad layouts, and these are very good for radio frequency in general and the MC. You can actually achieve twice the number of pins per unit area than through whole plate, and as a result, can significantly reduce the number of board layers, especially where you'd need 10 or more using through whole plate. Now here's an example of traditional microbiotechnology, technology, and um, you can see there's a core of FR4 or whatever, something cheap, and there are some through holes in it. There's a through hole right through the lock, and there's a through hole that was drilled through the FR4 core before the build-up layers were put on. Here's some pure polymer, or whatever, build-up layers, and here are some microvires. These are blind ones because they're on the outer layers, and these are buried ones because they're on the inner layers. Now, later on, we'll see, or let, in a future webinar, we'll see how we have modern microbiome technology, which is, has many advantages over this original stuff. Anyway, that's the basics. The thing with HDI is it helps to make the smallest, lightest, and least power-hungry products. You can find them in many toys and other common products. Um, like the Furby. Do you remember the Furby, a little furry toy that would talk to people? That had a, a microbiome board in it. With microbiome, you can use the smallest IC packages like a micro or miniature BGA, which is the subject of today's webinar, really. You can also use uh, the chip scale kind of packages like direct chip attach, flip chip, chip scale packaging, and tape automated bonding. Now, if you try to use these very small ICs, with through hole plate, uh, you'll basically blow yourself out of the water as far as EMC is concerned. You have to use them with microbiome, and then you can get excellent signal integrity in the EMC. The virus in pad rather than breakout traces and pin escape traces reduces the decoupling inductance, pushes the resonant frequencies of the power distribution network higher, which is what we want. Shorter traces are less efficient as accidental antennas. Smaller boards resonate at higher frequencies. All good stuff. Smaller sizes of the ICs and their close proximity to a good solid zero volt plane means they emit less. And the shorter traces might not need to be uh, created as controlled impedance lines. In fact, they invented HDI for cell phones because they discovered if they tried to make a cell phone as small as people wanted. You remember, I mean, I'm just rerunning some old episodes of Friends. And the cell phones that they have are the size of house bricks, they're quite literally. And uh, people wanted smaller ones, obviously, to fit in the pocket. And they had to invent HDI technology in order to do that. And mostly because of the solid zero-volt planes. 
And because they aren't perforated, they have lower impedances, hence lower emissions and better immunity. Um, and better SIMPI. They have a more constant return path inductance, which gives you better control of transmission lines. And you can even get good shielding between the circuits on the top and bottom sides that you can't do with through hole plate because the bio holes go all the way through. For instance, I've seen some cell phones with the digital circuitry on one side and the analog and RF technology on the other side. And with the addition of a couple of cans, you know, 10 cans on the board, you had good shielding between the two circuits. And under a BGA, of course, we can create a solid continuous zero volt or power plane which helps us to reduce the specs of filtering and shielding, which is what I said originally, that um, spending, spending the money, or at least doing the work, on the board level uh, saves more money. General rule of thumb is that for every layer of assembly um, that you go up, for instance, filtering and shielding is applied at the level of the enclosure, then it's at least 10 times more cost to deal with EMC than at the previous level of assembly, like in the printed circuit board. Whenever I mention uh, microwire, people always shuck, suck their teeth, they don't shuck their teeth, they suck their teeth, and they say, oh, but it's expensive. But it's just not true. The Institute of Printed Circuits that survey in May 2000 found there were 62 manufacturers of HDI boards worldwide. In May 2008, there were 32 manufacturers who can do HDI just in the UK which everybody knows is a small insignificant little island where mostly we show off our queen and that's about how we earn our money because um, the weather's not worth talking about. It's pretty good at the moment though. Now the thing with these board manufacturers is uh, the actual techniques, manufacturing techniques can vary and so you might need, you should always in fact check with your board manufacturer how he's going to build the boards before you start the layout. Don't just go to them with a standard layout and say, yeah, make that. The basic standard is IPC 2315. <clears throat> now, traditional HDI requires a different approach to board layout than we might have used it through whole plate. Depending on the supplier, some of the te EMC techniques that we might have used it through whole plate can't be used. However, what's its base? As I mentioned a minute ago, people seem to think that HDI is more costly, but the IPC survey in 2000 found that they could buy HDI boards for the same price as through whole plate. If you don't use buried wires, it makes them even cheaper. The latest advice, and people like Mentor Graphics are specialists in this area, is that boards needing uh, more than 8 to 10 layers in through whole plate should cost less if you make them in microwire. Less. For instance, high density 18 layer through whole plate, you only need 14 layers, I mean, beg your pardon, 10 layers in HDI, so they say. And the reason for this is, as you'll know, with a through hole plate, every time you increase the complexity and you have to add more layers to get the routing in, the increased complexity means more via holes. And every time you add an extra layer or two, um, you don't get the same routing density that you had on the first few layers and you, make, you get diminishing returns. And as soon as you get to 10 layers, if you can't manage with 10, you're pretty soon up to 16, 18, 20, and so on. You know, because each additional pair of layers doesn't give you much benefit. But with, through, with HDI, each layer has the full routing capability, just like the very first two or three that you had with through whole plane. However, that's just a basic comparison of cost. The point is that the EMC, SI, and PI advantages of microwire boards may well make it more cost effective than through whole plate with even lower densities and fewer layers than, than 8 or 10. And there's modern HDI technology. It has many advantages over the original HDI. And we're going to cover that in my next webinar on September 17th. So mark that in your diary because it's going to be very good. Well, I think it is anyway. So the next topic then is fine line through whole plane. 
at least we want to achieve a continuous mesh, a grid, if you like, of zero volts traces and power traces on the zero volt plane and power plane layers under every BGA. And that's to connect all the 0 volt power pins to their respective decoupling capacitors and, of course, to the rest of the planes on the rest of the board. This helps control emissions and, like I keep saying, it's good for SI and PI as well. Now, it won't be anything like half as good for EMC as a solid plane would be that you might get with microwire. But it will be the best we can do in through-hole plates. So if you're going to have a through-hole plate board, and remember, you can buy a microwire board for less money. Never mind what your purchasing department say, they're just not shopping around enough. You can buy a microwire board for less money. If you're going to stick with through-hole plate, then you at least want to use a mesh, which means using fine line technology. Now here's one. This is an a example of a layer in a board of a customer of mine that's done using 100 micron or 4 thou track and space rules. This isn't a plane layer, it's, but it's showing a fill, a zero volt fill on one of the signal layers. You can see all the zero volt pins here, which obviously don't have uh, antipads, clearance holes, and here are the pins which do have antipads. You can see the antipads are small enough that we can get a web of copper in between. Where we see things like this, where the antipads appear to have run together, this is just an artifact of the resolution of the um, uh, of the CAD station. When you zoom in, you find that there's actually copper in there. You know, there's another one there that's not real, but you need to check that it's not real. So, if you've got a ball grid array with a ball pitch of a millimeter or more, what's that? About 42 thou inches. We can create continuous meshes underneath using standard 175 micron or 7th hour track and space or track and gap, whatever you like, uh, layout rules. If you're between 0.1, sorry, 0.1, if you're between 0.8 and 1 millimeter, you're going to need 100 micron track and gap rules. That's 4,000 inches. And once again, when I mention this to people, they say, oh, but the cost, it's not true. For nearly 10 years now, you've been able to buy 100 micron track and gap offshore volume manufacture for the same price as 7,000, 175 micron. And if your buyers tell you that it's going to be more expensive, tell them to get off their backsides and just do their job, okay, and find you a supplier. Your buyers like to stick with certain suppliers because they get bottles of whiskey and things from them every year, or just because they're lazy. I hope there's no bias listening, by the way. Um, so make them do their job. When you've got a BGA pitch less than 0.8 of a millimeter, down to half a millimeter, you're going to need 50 micron tracking gap, which is 2,000. And as far as I'm aware, this still has a price premium attached to it. But how much of a price premium, I'm not sure. I don't think it can be that much. In the, even in the UK, there are some board manufacturers who can do this. You can use for prototypes, for instance. So, but there are BGAs uh, now coming down, going down to 0.25. Maybe they've just planned 0.25 millimeters, 25 micron spacing, 1,000 uh, ball pitch, which is amazing. I beg your pardon, not 1,000 ball pitch. What am I talking about? 0.25 millimeters. I can't think what that is in power just now, but it's a lot many. And I'm not, I haven't yet learned how to deal with those, but there are, uh, I've got a document that tells me how to do that. Uh, but I, I haven't learned enough to tell you about it just yet. So, time for some poll questions from Belinda. Thanks, Keith. Attendees, we'd like to ask you some questions. Please answer the following question. Solid PCB planes under ICs help achieve A, signal integrity only, B, power integrity only, C, EMC only, or D, all the foregoing. Give you a few seconds to answer. And 100% of you said D, which is correct. 
And we'll ask another one. Microvia PCB technology, A, provides the best planes under ICs, B, can help reduce the bomb cost, or C, both of the above. We'll give you a few seconds. And more than 90% said C, which is also correct. And the third one, fine line THP board technology, a, is useless for SI, PI, and EMC, B, can be useful for SI, PI, and EMC, or C, always adds too much to the bomb cost. We'll give you a few seconds. And again, overwhelming majority said B, which was correct. Back to you, Keith. Thanks, Belinda. Everybody seems to know everything. I don't know what I'm talking about. Sorry, I do know what I'm talking about, at least I hope I do. I don't know why I'm talking, since everybody knows it already. Anyway, an IC now may have multiple DC rails. In the good old days, everything ran on 5 volts. And that was it, on 5 volt power supply and away you went. Then people invented 3.3 volts. And that was a bit of a pain, because you had 5 volts and 3.3 volts. And then they went mad, and it seems that Every chip on the board has its own voltage rail, different voltage rail. Quite often you find this problem with um, FPGAs and, and big microprocessory type things, that they have uh, several voltage domains on them. If it's a, a well-designed uh, board grid array, or even uh, any other kind of package, it'll have all the pins associated with a certain voltage in the same area of the board. So you can do this. For instance, this 3.3 volt power plane picks up all of the 3.3 volt related pins. Notice we have a solid zero volt plane which extends beyond everything. All the components, all the traces, all the power planes. In fact, it's a good EMC technique to extend the 0 volt plane way beyond everything, say by an inch or two. For the Europeans that would be 25 to 50 millimeters, and um, use the, the actual bare board material as uh, to give you EMC benefits. Um, providing that you do other stuff correctly, good EMC practices on the board correctly, every time you double the, the moat of zero volt plane beyond everything else, you can reduce your emissions by 6 dB. So, you know, 6 dB, 12 dB, whatever. That's another example of where trying to get the cheapest, you know, board um, can be counterproductive. Anyway, there's the 3.3 volt pins. There's a plane, power plane that's picked up all the 2.5 volt pins. There's one that picks up all the core logic planes at 0.9 of a volt in this case, although, of course, it might not be 0.9 of a volt in your case. And there's some pins that are associated with 2.7 volt circuitry. Now, if your device isn't segregated, if the pins associated with different voltages are all mixed up together, then don't use it. Choose one that is, because obviously the manufacturer hasn't a clue. And there are some manufacturers are much better uh, with their pinouts than others. So we've got these different zero um, power planes all on the same layer if we can. Now you can't always do that. We'll talk about what if you can't always do that later on. But let's assume you can get everything on one layer. The important thing now is to uh, understand that the core logic power supply is a very noisy system, very noisy PDN. Uh, it must be embedded within the board and sandwiched between two zero volt planes at least and mustn't go anywhere near the edge. We'll talk about that again later on. The other thing is, each area of circuitry that's powered by a particular voltage needs to be located over, or under if you prefer, its power plane area. So all the 3.3 volt circuitry is under the 3.3 volt plane. All the 2.7 volt circuitry is under there, and all their traces are too. 
it's important that the traces don't cross the splits because then their return current doesn't know where to go. So say we've got um, a trace wants to go from here, uh, say to here, and your auto router might think, I know, I'll route it all the way around here because that saves on wire holes and I can't fit it in here because I don't have enough routing layer. I'd need to add some extra layers to the board to fit it in here. Well, the thing to do is to add the extra layers. Don't route the trace around here, whatever you do. Hmm? Unless, and we'll talk about unless later on, even so, it's not desirable. All the traces and components for each voltage um, should be within the plane area for that voltage. Let's look at that in cross-section. So here I've got uh, a cross-section through part of that, that board there. And I'm using an eight-layer asymmetrical stacker to give, us, give me a good distributed capacitance um, in the power distribution network. I've got a couple of zero-volt planes, and we like them to be on the outer layers, close to the chip, give us a good image plane effect, and give us effectively good shielding for the chip even without a 10 cam, and we put our power plane layers close to it to give a distributed capacitance, which is the best kind of capacitance that you can get, for, except for capacitance which is actually on the IC, which we'll talk about in a minute. So here, um, although on the previous drawing I only showed one 0 volt plane and one, say, 3.3 volt plane, you've actually got two for a symmetrical board stack up to give us, um, you know, less chance of board warp during manufacture, during soldering it. So here are all the components associated with the 3.3 volt area are within the 3.3 volt plane region. Here are all the components associated and traces associated with power plane 2 area, the 2.5 and volt. And inside the board we've got these extra spacing. We don't run the traces right up to the edge of the plane, the power plane. Okay, we keep them in. And the same at the edge of the board, where the, the zero volt plane extends beyond the power plane, and the traces should be within the power plane boundary as well, just by a few millimeters, but the more millimeters the better. The reason we want this spacing here is to reduce the crosstalk between these two areas. We don't want the noise that's present on the two and a half volt traces or planes to couple with the 3.3 volt traces or planes. What if you've got power planes on parallel layers in the board? And this is often necessary, especially if you have double-sided uh, board layout. Uh, you may have um, ICs on opposite sides of the board, and they've got different power requirements. So you have different planes in parallel. If you go back to here, this particular example here, it doesn't matter that these planes are in parallel because they have the same voltage. They're linked together quite often by the through holes. But if you've got uh, different voltage planes in parallel, then the straight capacitance between them, which is good if you've got power to power plane to zero volt plane or power to ground plane, that's good. Not good if you've got power plane to power plane capacitance if they're different voltages. Now, a typical problem here is your microprocessor or FPGA core logic, typically running between 0.9 and 1.2 volts. Now, I understand that people are working on um, uh, processors that run down to as low as 0.3 of a volt, which uh, I'm amazed by, but no doubt will happen one day. It'll be something like 0.3 of a volt at 1,000 amps or something, but anyway. Um, now, the processor core logic supply is very, very noisy. A uh, good ex an example uh, is the, the Xilinx Vertex 2. Now, we're on Vertex 7 at the moment, so Vertex 2 is five process shrinks ago. The core logic for Vertex 2 had some power demands that were 50 picoseconds in duration. That doesn't mean 50 picoseconds rise time. It means up and down within 50, within 50 picoseconds. That's a Vertex 2. Just think of the noise you must get on the core logic of a modern device with 22 nanometer design rules. 
very, very noisy. So we don't want that noise to couple into power planes, into parallel power planes, and where it might spread more widely around the board. So the trick, the way to deal with that is to put a new naught volt plane between them in the stack of So we add to a number of layers. So here is my example. This is another cross section of that board we had a minute ago. Except here we've got uh, 3.3 volts, 0.9 volts, and 2.7, 2.5. So the 2.7 has parallel capacitance with the 2.5. The 0.9 has parallel capacitance with the 3.3 and with the 2.5. A bit of fringing capacitance at the edges, so we don't worry about that for now. Anyway, you can see that the noisy plane is embedded within two zero volt planes, but it can couple nicely into these large planes, which will have much slower resonant frequencies. So what we do to deal with that, and I've had uh, some customers where they have to have four segregated power plane layers to deal with all their BGAs on both sides of the board. So that's two layers to feed the, the BGAs on one side and two to feed the BGAs on the other side. That was some years ago too. So there we go, we've added a couple more zero volt planes. There's the important one. It's sandwiching this 0.9 volt plane and the 2.7 volt plane so they can't leak, if you like, into these other planes. Can't leak noise into these other planes. Nothing's perfect, of course, but um, we've reduced the, the leakage by probably 40, 50, 60 dBs by doing that. We got this other plane, of course, for free, which doesn't hurt. The, the best printed circuit boards for SI and PI and EMC have as many ground plane layers, North Pole plane layers, as all the other layers combined. So if you have six layers with signals and power on, you have at least six, maybe seven, and that wouldn't work, would it? you have six naught volt plane layers. Anything less isn't as good as it could be. Okay. When we sandwich a power plane between two solid naught volt planes, like we saw on the previous slide, it also means that we don't have to worry about traces crossing power plane splits. Because all the traces, let's go back, all the traces now are all rooted around in between two planes, either a ground plane and a power plane. Sorry, all the traces, let's start again. All the traces, the signal traces, are rooted around between two power planes. That's not strictly true, is it? Would have been better if I put that power plane, that, that ground plane over there now, now I think about it. Anyway, um, you see a trace, say, in the 2.7 volt area, that might have wanted to wander into the 0.9 volt area would have been a big no-no before. But now, that trace crosses that split. It doesn't have a problem with the return current trying to cross the gap because it's effectively shielded by the zero volt plane. So the return current flows in the zero volt plane. That's what I'm trying to say on this slide. You don't have to worry about crossing splits between different power plane areas if the power planes are sandwiched between two naught volt planes. Also, sandwiching a power plane between two naught volt planes can double the decoupling, the embedded decoupling capacitance, which is good. That decoupling capacitance is what we rely on above 300 megahertz, that embedded decoupling capacitance. So doubling it can only be a good thing. Another technique which can help with BGAs is to use copper filled or copper capped fires. We generally only use copper filled fires when we're trying to carry heat away from the device. They're sometimes called thermal fires. So copper capping is the important issue here, at least having a solid copper layer on the top. When you're routing a BGA with through hole plate, we end up with these things called dog bones. I've got a, a rather blurry picture of some coming up in a minute. But with wire in pad, we don't uh, need to worry about the dog bones. So it increases the routing under the uh, device, routing capability. And, um, well, that's it really. <laughs> Here's an example of a, a board that's been made with uh, copper capping. You can see 
There are no wire holes. I mean, there are wire holes. It's a through-hole plate board. There's wire holes under all of these, but they're all copper capped. Now the, the wire holes don't steal solder when you're, while you're reflow soldering. And any gas inside isn't going to blow out and blow a, blow a hole in the solder and make a dry joint. In volume, it adds about 10% to the cost of the bare board. So it adds a lot more cost in prototype. So the trick in prototyping is to just go around with, get it without the copper capping, and go around with high temperature solder and a soldering iron and fill them up. Of course, you've got to bake them nice and flat, haven't you? So it's quite tricky, but it saves money. Anyway, it adds about 10% to the cost of the board, but these guys who made this board reckoned it was worth it for the benefits it gave them, for the cost it saved them later in the process. This is always the way to think about printed circuit board technology. Spending money on printed circuit boards is as an investment to save more money down the road. Like I said before, your manager who thinks that the board has to be cheap if you're going to make a profit on the product is actually doing you harm. It's often the case that you want to have an expensive board to save more money elsewhere. Here's an example of decaps around a BGA. This is actually, I was at a, an Agilent um, seminar on high-speed um, digital comms the other day. And this is their 40 giga sample um, per second sampler in one of their oscilloscopes. And it's a special, specially made component. And I, I just took this photo because it had a nice array of decoupling capacitors all around the ball grid array. On the other side, also had a nice array of decoupling capacitors around the ball grid array, and it's got these deca decaps soldered across the middle. So this will be soldered to the um, uh, pads rather than obviously fire holes. Now you can see the dog bones in here. I won't zoom in because it's a horrible blurry picture. I just snapped this during a, a break time, and. Um, and you noticed it was blurry later on when it was too late to do something about it. So you can see these little log bones in here, which means that if you wanted to do any trace routing on this layer, it's going to be very difficult. But with a violin pad, you could actually run traces around on this layer if you want to. So, interesting photo anyway. We might be doing our decoupling with ordinary capacitors like the previous slide. Notice this has got ordinary I guess these are 0402s, maybe they're 0201s. Ordinary capacitors, but that's not the best capacitor to use. These days we have a wide choice of capacitors specially made for decoupling. For instance, the reverse aspect capacitors. Now instead of an 0402, it'll be called 0204. Instead of 0805, 0508. Murata have some, um, they call this the LLL series. Then there's interdigitated capacitors. I'll show you an example of one in a minute. AVX have a thing called IDC for interdigitated capacitor. They also have a, uh, a capacitor made on a ball grid array as a ball grid array package called a LICA or low inductance chip array. Murata have two types of interdigitated capacitors, the LLA and LLM series. You may have heard of X2Y devices. These are balanced capacitors. They've got three sets of plates in them and they have four terminals. And they make great balanced filters. Yeah, filters for balanced lines. And you can also use them as decouplers. They have the big advantage that their balanced construction basically cancels out a large part of their ESL. So they work much better at high frequencies. Then there's lossy capacitors. We try to make our um, power distribution network out of planes, power and, and not volt planes, that um, give us an embedded capacitance. And the trouble with that is that you end up with a sort of parallel plate resonance. And one way of dealing with that then is to dampen, uh, dampen the resonances down with some resistance. Obviously, if you just bang a one ohm resistor between the power and ground planes, it's going to get rather hot and dissipate quite a bit of, actually not so bad, I suppose. One ohm on 3.3 .3 volts would give you about 10 watts. Um, still, it's power dissipation we don't want. 
So Murata have some uh, capacitors specially made with very high values of ESR up to an ohm internally. So it's basically a DC block with a, a damping capacitor in series with it. So that's very nice. Then we have bur buried, <laughs> buried capacitors like the Murata GRU series. These are very skinny capacitors which are actually built inside the printed circuit board. They're not soldered on the top. They're um, laminated inside the printed circuit board. Now, you can get almost all kinds of components as buried components. Obviously, we have all we all have buried integrated circuits in our pockets with our smart cards. So buried ICs, buried capacitors, buried resistors. Um, it's a big movement at the moment in the PCB world to make PCBs which have no components soldered on them at all. Everything is buried in the laminate. And also, we have distributed capacitance, or sometimes called embedded capacitance, using proprietary board laminates. Now, we can always, of course, make embedded capacitance using uh, just pairs of planes, and the closer together they are, the better. So, power plane in parallel with a normal plane, preferably about 0.1 of a millimeter apart or less. But there are proprietary board laminates you can get, which get, which you can get them to be very skinny. Uh, I've seen some which are down to uh, five or six microns thick. And working, with, they're a bit like gold foil, you know, floats around on the slightest breeze. Apparently, though, you can some of them anyway. You can use in standard printed circuit board manufacturing plant. Don't ask me how, but they're very tough. You know, they're made of Kevlar or something, or Anyway, they're strong enough to be able to handle. And because they're very thin, and they may even use a high capacitance, uh, a high dielectric constant material, they give much more embedded capacitance per unit area than ordinary FR4 boards will do. There's a variety of people in this market. There's Okbitsui with their Faradflex product. There's 3M with their ECM product. I think it stands for embedded capacitance material. Um, DuPont have a thing called Interra. Sanmina have MCAP, and of course they also have, uh, what's it called now? Uh, it's the Hadco buried capacitance. Hadco buried capacitance? Anyway, um, they've got their other materials. These are just three of them. The great thing with these in distributed embedded capacitance materials is that if you use the very thin ones, you can uh, eliminate your cavity resonance completely. Which is wonderful. I said we've been looking at the Vertex 7 again. This is an exploded view of it. And it's there to show us show off their um, stacked die construction. I think there's seven layers and each of them has a billion transistors on or something. This board, the board, the substrate that they're mounted on is a microvire board all the microvires in there. But the important thing is these capacitors. Let's look at these. Let's zoom in. Hang on. Uh, view, zoom, 400%. All right. There we go. See here some good examples of these advanced uh, capacitors on this microvire substrate, which quite possibly, I don't know, has a buried power flex or something like that layer in it as well. So here's the interdigitated capacitors, and you'll, if you look at the pin out, it'll go power ground, power ground, power ground, power ground, all the way around. These are the reverse aspect ones. That'll be something like an 0402. This is probably an, an 0508, an 0508 IDC, or one of the Murata range. I can't remember the numbers now. Anyway. So, a nice example of microvire plus special decoupling capacitors. Here's an iPhone 5 with lots and lots of reverse aspect capacitors around it. And notice also um, pads around the edge here for the zero volt plane for soldering the tin can on top of this A6. 
And that's the end. Okay, it's time for some more poll questions. Okay. Attendees, please answer the following question. Multiple DC rails for an IC is best achieved with A, full-size voltage planes on different layers, or B, plane layers split into different voltage areas. We'll give you a few seconds to answer. And about more than 90% said B, which is correct. Here's another one. The core logic power plane is best placed, A, on an outer layer of the stack up, or B, on an inner layer of the stack up. We'll give you a few seconds. Everybody's on the ball today. Uh, B, which is correct, and 90% said B. Here's another one. Copper fills are capped via holes. A, are useful for easing the routing under a BGA or B, it always adds too much bomb cost. I'll give you a few seconds. And the majority said A, which is correct. And one final one. Power integrity can be improved by using A, special types of capacitors, B, buried capacitors, C, embedded distributed capacitance. And looks like we have some answers in all three, which all three are correct, too. Keith, do you have anything you'd like to say about the polls? Very good. And I'm sorry about the trick question on number seven, because all the answers are correct. <laughs> Thanks so much, Keith. We'd like to have a call for final questions. Please enter any last questions you may have in the navigation pane. We have received quite a few inquiries on where to get additional information on this topic. There's a vast amount of content found on our website, interferencetechnology.com, and Keith's website, cherryclough.com. You can also email us at info at interferencetechnology.com with specific needs, and we can direct you accordingly. Keith, here's a question for you. Surely it is better to split the 0V planes associated with each DC voltage rail into different areas and star them together at a single point? We and many other manufacturers have always done this or at least split the zero V planes between the analog and digital circuits? Well, the short answer is no, uh, but now I'm going to give you a long answer, um, because this, this thing always comes up, and it, it's, it's a historical uh, bias. Many years ago, people had problems when they, uh, on, in systems and printed circuit boards, and they discovered that if they uh, split up the, the return path, they could get rid of those problems. Now, most of those were at 50 or 60 hertz, and they would just hum. So you'd hear people talking about hum loops and things like that. But they didn't know about electromagnetic propagation. Or if they did, they thought it was mainly for radio frequencies, which it isn't. Electromagnetic propagation is how all our electricity works, whether it's power or signals or digital or analog or whatever. Whatever the frequency, it's all electromagnetic propagation. So what we find when we look at any circuit, doesn't matter what scale, what frequency, we find that if we split the, the return paths up, which is the, the grounds in this case, unless we're using differential, and even if we're using differential, there's still some column mode current flowing in the ground network. If we split the ground up, we interrupt some current flow. Now there's always some differential mode current flow that's crossing, that wants to cross from one area to the other, or if there isn't differential mode because you've designed it carefully that way, there's always some stray current flowing from one to the other. Now when you put a split in the return current path, um, you make it very difficult for the laws of nature to give you uh, a compact field. And the compact field is what we want for SI, PI, and certainly for EMC. Um, this all comes down to one of Maxwell's equations. It's Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. It basically says currents always flow in the path with the least impedance. This actually comes from quantum mechanics, or quantum electrodynamics, so we don't need to go there. But it's often expressed in EMC textbooks as keep the loop area small. Always keep the loop area small. And what they often forget to say 
is keep the loop area small for the stray currents as much as for the currents you wanted. Of course, when you split uh, a zero volt or ground plane, um, you end up with some of those currents having uncontrolled paths, loop paths, large areas. If so, um, a current flowing in a large area creates more of a magnetic field. Magnetic fields are the, the, the common way, the most common way in which our printed circuit boards emit radiation, electromagnetic radiation, because they're running at low voltages. When you've got current flowing through an inductance, you created the inductance, remember, by splitting the zero volt system, you end up with a noise voltage. You get voltage differences between the two planes, so they radiate beautifully like dipole antennas with electric fields. And they can also be more immune to electric fields. So this is bad, and it's bad also even at audio frequencies, never mind radio frequencies. The other problem, of course, is that these splits have a physical dimension. And they will behave, not they might, they will behave as, as accidental slot antennas. We often talk about accidental wire or trace antennas, but these are accidental slot antennas. And of course, the chances are that they'll resonate, happen to resonate at some clock harmonic. And uh, Murphy's Law always applies. What this means is that the, your first prototypes and your first production will be just fine. But then somebody will come along when you're selling you know, a million a month or something and just crank up the clock frequency by 5%. And then one of the harmonics will land on one of your split harmonic, split resonant frequencies. And the emissions will, having been well under the limit line, will come streaming up maybe to 40 or 50 dBs above the limit line at one or more frequencies. And uh, of course, just turning the clock frequency up 10% means you don't need to bother doing the, um, or 5%, means you don't need to bother doing the, the uh, EMC tests again. And you discover you've got millions of customers complaining of problems. Companies have gone bust for things like that because all these products are under warranty, you see. When all your products come back under warranty, you're in a very difficult situation. So, just to summarize, um, it turns out splitting naught volts or ground return paths has always been a bad idea. Now, I used to do this, just like everybody else. In the 70s, I used to do this. In the 80s, I learned not to do it. Of course, you still have to split a plane if you want galvanic isolation. But for Ever since um, about 1981, I've worked on hundreds, literally hundreds of printed circuit board designs, and I haven't split a zero volt plane for any reason other than galvanic isolation. And they've all been um, wonderful. Even audio, hi-fi, audio, professional audio, instrumentation, you name it. Splitting return paths, splitting naught volt planes has always been a bad idea. Okay. I should shut up now. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Here's another question for you. Power ground planes on parallel layers can resonate and worsen emissions and immunity at those frequencies. So isn't it always better to use traces to distribute DC power instead? Well, not always. Um, the, when you have a trace and a, and a capacitor or, or one or more decoupling capacitors at the end of it, that still has a resonant frequency, and it's actually a lot lower than you get with a plane, um, which usually puts it more into the range of where you're likely to coincide with some system frequency and cause a problem. The traditional way of dealing with that is to put a ferrite bead in series, and, and that's fine. It works very well. But the trouble is, with a lot of modern ICs, when you put the ferrite bead in series with the power supply rail, you end up with um, too high a uh, uh, power supply impedance at low frequencies. So the only way to achieve a power supply impedance at low frequencies, I mean, back in 1990, mm, no, back in 2008, I think it was, the, the power distribution specs for a PC motherboard were that you had to achieve um, for the you know, uh, power, power rail of the chip, you had to achieve um, something like a quarter of a milliohm from 
DC to 1.2 gigahertz. Now you aren't going to do that if you've got a Fahrenheit bead in series with a trace. No, you have to use pl parallel planes. You have to use embedded capacitance because that's the only way of getting a low impedance above about 300 megahertz. You can't do it with discretes. Maybe with some X2Ys, you know, perhaps you can do it. But the best way to do it is with embedded capacitance, which means you use planes. Now, as I mentioned before, with planes, if you use a very thin proprietary dielectrics like Farad Flex or ECM, uh, you can get a plane with no cavity resonances, which is excellent. And also, you've got such a, a very large distributed capacitance that you don't need the coupling capacitors, except for bulk capacitors, you know, 100 microfarad tantalums or something like that. So you end up with a perfect decoupling capacitor. Um, doesn't resonate and provides a very low impedance to a very high frequency. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. Another question. Aren't micro vias less reliable than THP because they are so small? Well, you'd think so. And I used to wonder about that too. But um, there's been some military tests done on um, for computers and aircraft, and they found that with the shake and bake routine, uh, that the uh, microvia boards are actually tougher. And it turns out, I read the article ages ago, I can't remember the reference now, but it turns out that the aspect ratio of a microvia, despite the fact that it's very small, it's also not very tall. And a, a, th a thin through hole plate VR, like it might be half a millimeter diameter, it might be one and a half millimeters long. We've got an aspect ratio of about 30 to 1. And it turns out that that's actually quite unreliable. And of course, if you're going to pepper your board with two millimeter diameter VIAs, then you're not going to have a very good computer. Because uh, you, <laughs> or it's, it'll be a very large one anyway. So it turns out that micro VIAs are actually uh, tougher, more reliable than through a whole plane. Now, when we look at um, advanced uh, HCI on September the 17th, I'll show you some pictures of um, a modern uh, microvere technique, which actually makes the microvere as a solid copper slug. So it doesn't have a, like a little cone shape, like I showed before. It's actually a, like a solid copper bead squashed in the board. That has two advantages. One is that it makes it really tough, you know, really very strong indeed. The other one is that um, it doesn't even trap a little pocket of gas underneath the solder ball. So you don't have the outgassing problem when you go through the, the solder oven that can sometimes affect um, firing pad using microvias. So in other words, you get a copper capped effect of a copper cap via along with a microvia. So I hope that's answered that question. Okay. We received so many great questions that we will try to address in the future. Keith, thank you again for your time and expertise. Attendees, if you like our webinars, join us this October for EMC Live. This is a brand new online multi-day event hosted by Interference Technology. The event will feature roundtables, webinars, and panels on everything EMC related. Visit emclive2014.com for more information. Attendees, if you have any more questions we didn't answer here today, please send us an email at info at interferencetechnology.com. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website. We will also send a link to all participants shortly. Thank you for attending.